What's up, Internet? Jordan here from Arrow to the Mead. Today, we're going to be... Waiting for the AC to finish running. It's over 100 degrees here today. I'm not turning the AC off. Sorry. Let's try this again, I guess. What's up, Internet? Jordan here from Arrow to the Mead. And today, we're going to be wrapping up my attempt to follow the elderflower braggot recipe from the r slash mead subreddit wiki. Let's get right into it. So we left off right after I pitched the yeast for this, and there's no fancy secondary or anything like that, so the rest of fermentation was pretty much just a matter of pulling out the herb bag with the elderflower and the heather after three days, as indicated in the instructions. But I did run into a couple snags on this one that were born out of my lack of experience with brewing beer or braggot kind of things. You may remember from the original video, this is the first time that I've used malt or malt extract of any kind, and I've only tried to carbonate two other beverages, both of which did not carbonate properly. And just to make things harder on myself, I was trying to do this without asking for any help. The first thing that this led me to face plant on was the final gravity. You see, the recipe itself leans a little bit towards force carbonating, and as such, it actually discusses stabilizing and back sweetening the beverage. Because of this, I assumed that the final gravity presented in the recipe was the suggested final gravity after back sweetening partially because of that, and partially because I just didn't know enough to know what I didn't know. I didn't realize that the malt you use for beers and braggots is typically not completely fermentable. In most meat and wine, all of your sugar is fermentable. Unless you are specifically introducing a non-fermentable sugar like erythritol, and you'll know if you're making that exception, you expect a lower ABV mead or wine like this to go bone dry. 1.000 or even lower 0.998 or something. But apparently this doesn't usually happen with beer and braggots. Some of the malt sugars are not fermentable and your brew typically won't finish at a bone dry gravity. Because I didn't know this, I thought my brew had stalled. I even went so far as to work up a new starter using Spark, a yeast from the fort that is advertised as being specifically really good at restarting stuck fermentations. Of course, the fermentation wasn't stuck, it was done, so that starter didn't do anything. When that also failed to have an effect, I did a little bit more research and that led me to ultimately realize I was missing some information and my brew was actually just fine and ready to wreck. I suspect that some of the more experienced beer and braggot brewers are getting a kick out of this mistake, but hey, maybe if there's anybody else like me that started from still meads and still wines, I can save you from making the same mistake. In any case, the bright side to this particular screw up is that, well, it didn't actually screw anything up. One failed repitch isn't gonna have any noticeable impact on the flavor, so no harm, no foul, and one unforgettable lesson. The second thing I face planted on was, you guessed it, bottle conditioning. You see, this time I was determined I was going to get the bubblies. And I'd given up on the carbonation tablets as they had already failed me twice, so I decided to move on to just using table sugar and a priming sugar calculator. I wasn't particularly familiar with messing with volumes of CO2, but luckily the priming sugar calculator I found included suggested volume ranges for different styles of beer. And I thought, well, I really wanna make sure that I get bubbles this time. So what I'm gonna do is not go completely crazy and pick the highest number they suggest, but I'll pick something on the higher end. The highest number they suggested for any of those beers was 4.5 volumes of CO2, so I decided I was going to move forward with 4 volumes of CO2, which is apparently a lot. I prepared my priming sugar by weighing it out and then thoroughly dissolving it in a little bit of water, which I then poured into a sanitized bucket so that I could rack my braggot on top of that and rely on the swirling motion of the racking to get most of the mixing done for me. Alas, when I completed this racking, I realized that I had somewhat significantly overestimated the amount of product that I was going to have available, which meant I had actually introduced more sugar than intended, and I was already using a pretty heavy-handed dose. I went ahead and finished bottling to avoid prolonging the oxygen exposure at this point, but after I got all that done, I went back to the computer and tried to do a little bit of math to get my best guess at how many volumes of CO2 did I just put in these bottles? and I think it was about 4.6. To make matters worse, I used recycled beer bottles for this batch. A little bit of research showed that 
people start to report issues with these around three volumes of CO2, and it only gets worse from there. At 4.6 volumes of CO2, I was, well, pretty much guaranteed to have bottle bombs. So, after just a couple days of bottle conditioning, I pulled one bottle out, put it in the fridge until chilled, and then cracked it open to test and see how carbonated we were. While it wasn't completely explosive, it did spray a little bit, so I was clearly already more than well carbonated. The first thing I did was move the remaining bottles into the refrigerator to slow down fermentation. However, I remembered that BC from Doing the Most had mentioned on his channel how he's actually had bottle bombs go off in his refrigerator. Unfortunately, refrigeration does not always completely stop fermentation. It'll slow it down a lot, but it can still happen. So I didn't want to rely on refrigeration to keep these bottles safe. I also would like to be able to share these with people and in transit, they wouldn't be able to be refrigerated. And I cannot guarantee how my friends are going to keep them until they drink them. So this just didn't seem like a good place to be. Although I knew it was going to be dangerous, I decided my only real option here was to pasteurize by heating the bottles to a certain temperature and then keeping them at that temperature for a certain amount of time. I could basically guarantee that all of the yeast in there gets killed off completely and as close to guarantee as possible that fermentation is completely done. It's not restarting. We're done. These won't explode. The problem though, which you probably already noticed, is the heating process itself is going to temporarily increase the pressure inside of those bottles. And since they're already over carbonated, there's a pretty good chance that some of them will not survive the process. And with that in mind, I really cannot recommend that you do this at home. But I didn't feel like I had much of another choice. These bottles were basically going to explode on me one way or another, and shy of dumping them out and just giving up on the brew entirely, it seemed like the best option was to make sure that if they were going to explode, they exploded at the time and place of my choosing. By pasteurizing. I figured if anything survived pasteurizing, it was going to be stable. If I didn't pasteurize, these are going to become time bombs that exploded at probably terribly inconvenient times and places, not under any sort of control whatsoever, and the chances that somebody got hurt were going to be a lot higher. So during the pasteurization process, I made sure to stay on the other side of a wall from the stovetop as much as possible to try and minimize the chances that one of them blew while I was standing next to it. And uh, in the end, I got a little bit lucky and it worked out. I did actually have four whole bottles blow on me. Three of them only blew off their crown cap, but one of them actually completely shattered into little glass pieces. Luckily, no person or part of the house was harmed in the pasteurization process, although I did have quite a bit of a mess to clean up. Please keep in mind that the moral of this story is not how to get out of this situation so much as it is please don't put yourself in the situation in the first place. The pasteurization process I went through here and the exploding bottles is a fun story, but at the end of the day, that was kind of dangerous. The much better solution is to be mindful of your priming sugar calculations. Make sure you have a pretty good sense of how much product you've actually got on your hands. Don't over or underestimate dramatically the way that I did and make sure that the bottles you're going to be using can handle the volumes of CO2 you plan to put in them. Whew. Well, luckily that brings us to today, and I think I can call the bottles that survived a success. Now, I don't know how well this is gonna show up on camera. We do have a bit of lease at the bottom here. I think I potentially could have let this sit in secondary for longer in an attempt to, you know, make sure that everything settled out and that this was more clear before bottling. But I also think that a chunk of that is somewhat unavoidable when you're bottle conditioning. You have some active fermentation going in there. That's literally what makes bottle conditioning work. So you're going to have a little bit of trub stuff going on at the bottom. Oh, I should hold this in front of the mic so you can hear it. Uh, I hope the mic picked that up. That's much better than the tropical cider one we tried. Now you will see the floaters when I go to pour this for you guys. They're not harmful or anything. A little bit of a texture issue if you don't like that feel. That's not great, but um, they're fine to drink. As you can see, 
<laughs> we're probably a little over carbonated here. But hey, after, you know, two attempts at carbonating where my beverages were borderline flat, I'm pleased to see this as the alternative. I'd rather this than have them be flat. And... Yeah, you can see some of the floaties in there, I think, on the camera. I'm trying to see in the preview what's uh, what's in frame. And they're, they're not too bad. It's just something to note, though, that it is there. All right, this is going to take me a hot minute to pour, so I think we're going to time skip ahead to when I've got the rest of this in the... Um... All right, that's close enough for now. And yeah, you can definitely see I've got some floaters going in there. But aside from the floaters, it's uh, actually relatively clear, which is probably not super obvious on the camera um, because it's chilled, so the glass is frosting. But yeah, not bad. Overall, this is great. Probably not to anyone's surprise because this is a recipe by Storm Before Dawn and Storm is super experienced, but it's great. The orthonasal seems to be dominated by the elderflower and punctuated with notes of honey. On the palate, the carbonation kicks in and probably unsurprisingly, given that I gave this enough sugar for 4.6 volumes of CO2, it's probably a little bit too much. When you combine that with the fact that, if you'll remember, I also accidentally put in almost twice as much hops as I was supposed to, this is almost definitely a good bit more harsh and bitter than Storm probably intended when he put this recipe together. That said, I'm a fan of IPAs. I'll drink plenty of bitter beers, so the bitterness to this doesn't bother me at all. Actually, I quite enjoy it. But if you're thinking you might want to try following Storm's recipe at home and you're not as big of a fan of the bitter stuff, then make sure that you don't fall into those same two mistakes that I did. Don't overhop and don't overcarbonate. I actually did have one bottle that came out slightly less carbonated for whatever reason, and it was significantly smoother than these. So I'm pretty sure that if you follow the recipe a little bit more closely, you can get a much smoother version of the same beverage. I'm happy with either of them, but if you don't like super bitter stuff, yeah, make sure you go without those mistakes. The maltiness also shows up in the palate here, kind of for the first time, because I don't really get it in the nose. And the honey reappears just a little bit. Together, they remind me a bit of a honey blonde beer. Of course, the bite and the bitterness and the elderflower all distinctly separate this on the whole from a honey blonde beer, but there's a foundational layer of the palate here, kind of the base of the recipe that kind of has some uh, similarities going on there. And the juxtaposition of that honey blonde base with some of the elderflower and other bitter, more aggressive flavors is really pleasing. The retronasal or the exhale is actually pretty similar to the nose, but some of the CO2 lingers behind, almost crackling like pop rocks, and some of that hot bitterness sort of lays down beside it. So what you end up with is a retronasal or an exhale that is dominated by the elderflower and the honey, but also kind of bittered. Overall, I'd consider this a success. Obviously, I made a few mistakes on this one, but luckily, they're the kind of mistakes that you guys can learn from without me having to ruin any of my brews. At the end of the day, none of the mistakes I made really cost me much, if anything, on the flavor front, and I still have a very enjoyable beverage on my hands here. In any case, this has been Jordan from Arrow to the Mead. Thank you for joining me, and have a good however long until I see you again.